Now, what I want to take you through today is uh, just a standard townhouse kind of development. Um, in this case, we've got eight units uh, on a small block, so it's a fairly stereotypical uh, development. The architectural brief was to put as many townhouses on this block as council will let you. And the architects said, no, I won't do that. That's horrible. Yes, OK, um, let's see what we can do. Um, uh, so we, we take this example, it's got a, a shared driveway. It's a little bit too big for the deemed to satisfy uh, stuff in the planning code, but uh, there are lots and lots of these developments going on. So we do still need a fairly uh, straightforward tool to um, help these projects get through the planning scheme and hit their targets. So if we take an example like this, um, we'll get the site area. It's, uh, I'll just start running you through. Um, through how to use the tool um, and really try and demonstrate, I guess, how, uh, how simple this tool is to use and how quick. Um, so let's just say we're in Marion. When you load the council in the tool, it immediately loads all your local IFDs for the council area. So your um, infiltration frequency duration uh, curves and also 20 years of local uh, rainfall data to uh, allow the continuous simulations to occur in the background of the tool. Um, so how the map works is uh, you can just enter an address or alternatively you can do an approximate address and just drop this little pin uh, to the site that you, you want to work with. So um, let's just say uh, randomly this tower, this house was going to get converted into uh, townhouses, that would be our project here. And you also want the, to put in the site area um, of the, uh, the development and just select the type. So that gets us started. If we go back to our, our map, um, we can see there's eight apartments. Um, we, we want to tell the tool how many uh, people are in this development because that sets how much water is likely to be used from uh, the fittings and fixtures. Um, you can do any sort of development, but uh, any sort of residential or non-residential building going uh, to the building code classes. But in this case, we've got a multi-unit development. Uh, we say the internal floor area is perhaps um, uh, double story, so about 600 square meters. Um, and that will give us about 15 people in our eight apartments, which is about right. You'll have some apartments with a small families. It might have three or four and some apartments with single people. But on average, um, we, we know that there might be about 15 people. So the sensitivity isn't huge for the occupancy, but um, it is important to tell the tool roughly how much water use is going to be going on uh, with the development. So that's it for entering your data for the site. Um, now we go to the design section. This is the second section. Uh, up here, we've got our navigation buttons. You can navigate back and forwards. But what we're really trying to do is meet these multiple criteria of the, uh, the planning code and the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Guide plus drought resilience, um, uh, just to make sure the city isn't running out of water in in uh, dry years. So we have volume. So this is about uh, annual average volume. Uh, we have flow, which is about the peak flow. So that's um, reducing flooding downstream and, and pressure on the stormwater pipes for any, from any particular stormwater event. And we have water quality. So uh, the tool itself measures um, total nitrogen, TN, and the target is a 45% reduction. And that's taken as a proxy for TSS and phosphorus and litter, because if you can remove the nitrogen to a level of 45%, it's almost certain that you'll be removing all the other pollutants as the nitrogen is the hardest one to remove. Um, in terms of which is most significant, if you're on the coast, probably sediment and litter are the most uh, significant pollutants for, um, for the beaches, but uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus are most significant for inland waterways. Um, but I will, I will go through. So the way the tool actually works is you add your impervious areas. Uh, so 
uh, going back to our site, we would choose the roof area. And we'd assume that it's probably not going to have all the downpipes connected to the water tanks. There'll be some roof area that, that connects uh, straight to street drainage. Uh, but in this case, we've got 80% of the roof areas connected to the water tanks. So that's going to be uh, 360 square meters connected up to 10, uh, 1550 liter tanks. Uh, with this tool, it's fine to aggregate all your roof areas. Um, the tool kind of does this in the back end. So you can just um, add all your different roof areas as one solution. And uh, we're going to have 15,000 litres of water tanks in here. Um, when you do this, also, it brings up simplified diagrams that people can use for their, their reporting. Uh, and we just go through and uh, at our different impervious areas. Um, so of course, to use the tool, you probably need a set of site plans and maybe a PDF um, measurer to, to be able to measure the areas of the site plans or a schedule of, of, um, of areas. So in this case, we've got um, 90 square meters of a roof that's not connected to a tank and there's no treatments. Uh, we've also got some other impervious areas. We've got a couple of areas of, of pathways, um, some of which are connected to drainage and some of which are not. Um, with this tool, you don't have to add pervious areas. Um, the tool will assume that anything you don't add into the tool is essentially grass or gravel that, that won't generate runoff, uh, except in really extreme um, uh, rainfall events like a one in five or a one in 10 year, and then it will count the, the pervious areas plus the impervious. Um, but here we've got, uh, so pathway one, I'll just uh, enter this and then we'll get back into, I guess the, the more interesting. So we've got uh, 180 here, add, um, we won't add pathways because it's not connected to anything, um, but we'll do the driveway, which is 205. And that is pretty much it for the, the, uh, the data entry of the tool. So once we've entered all our details, we can go down in here and go pretty much down to the results. And we find that, uh, for our different multiple criteria, we haven't quite passed everything yet. So um, we're generating too much runoff uh, from this big impervious imper driveway and roof area. Um, we still need another cubic meter or so of uh, storage area and we're not quite hitting quality targets. All right, so what does all this mean? It means we get to uh, play with the settings and I'll just take you through the different I guess, criteria and explain, uh, explain what it is that we're trying to do here um, so that you have a, a bit more of an understanding, I guess, of how, how the tool can help you hit this. So the, the first one up is average annual volume reduction targets. Now, um, a lot of this work comes from the work of uh, John Argue at the University of SA. Uh, John Argue for a long time has been recommending that people uh, use volume-based targets rather than event-based targets. Um, this is also built into the new environmental regulations in Victoria and uh, the Australian Rainfall and Runoff talks about this a lot as does the uh, South Australian, New South Australian Planning Code. So um, what we're trying to do with uh, volume reduction is it, it's not the, the traditional rational method where you look at uh, a single storm event and how that that goes through the drainage system. It's looking at overall uh, what happens over the course of the year. And the theory behind average annual volume reduction is that a forested catchment uh, will evapotranspirate and infiltrate probably at least 80% of the precipitation that falls on that catchment. Whereas once you get to an urban catchment, uh, 
80% of the water will run immediately off into waterways, causing a lot more erosion and flooding. Uh, and only 20% will be trans evaporated and infiltrated. So when you have very low rates of uh, evapotranspiration and infiltration, it's, it, it causes big problems, uh, particularly during heat wave events where you can get more of the urban heat island effect. There's not enough moisture to uh, regulate uh, humidity and, and peak temperatures. And also it can be very hard on the street trees and, and uh, uh, any wetlands and everything else uh, that relies on uh, groundwater flow to survive. So um, infiltration is really a, a drought proofing measure uh, for the dry years. Um, we still need, I guess, uh, overland flow paths for the really big storm events. So the infiltration and trans evaporation doesn't replace um, your overland flow paths for the big one in 20 or one in 100 year storm events. But uh, for the 90% or 95% of precipitation that falls as small storms, um, it's really important to, uh, I suppose, mimic hydraulically a, a more forested catchment. Um, so for the engineers in the room, um, and I, for those people who, who, I guess, want to understand stormwater uh, more, how we how we will graph this is we have something called flow rates. We like to use the, the letter Q for, I guess, how much water is flowing and time. So when you take a forested catchment, uh, the hydrology looks like this black line or even a, a, a country catchment. Um, you have water and after a rainfall event, uh, a lot of it will be soaked up or infiltrated. Um, you have high base flow rates and small uh, flood or peak flow rates. When you go and pave all that and drain it, uh, this hyd hydrology line, hydrological line gets a lot more peaky. You get a lot more water just rushing off the surface, uh, surface and things get a lot drier between, uh, between your storm events and your hydrographs. So how can we um, mimic, I guess, a, a forest catchment? Well, one of our main toolkits, I guess, is just harvesting stormwater. Um, we, we can harvest water to uh, use back in developments and for irrigation that provides an immediate amenity and, and economic benefits, uh, as well as also perhaps providing detention uh, as part of our water tanks. So a, a water tank based detention is a reserve space at the top of the tank uh, with a slow leak, uh, you, we call that a, an, an orifice plate that is just reserved for the big storm events. This will fill up during a storm event and then just drain out slowly. Um, and that way we can avoid the fast drainage that would contribute to flooding. We just have slow drainage that will drain out over the course of hours or days. Uh, we can also use uh, infiltration type measures um, uh, such as this to uh, get more water into the ground in a deliberate kind of way. Um, now there's there's rules about infiltration. Um, you need to be aware of uh, your soil type and also clearances from footings and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of work's been done in South Australia, a lot of groundbreaking work. Um, but if you want more guidance, I guess, on the basic do's and don'ts, uh, we've built that into Insight Water. And you can go to the support section, you can go to water treatment systems and you can click on uh, things like uh, permeable paving or infiltration. And it'll, it'll give you the basic do's and don'ts, you know, don't do this if you're on a steep slope or there's a high groundwater or there's a rock close to the surface. Uh, it gives you the other um, soil maps and links to uh, other best practice guidelines if you really want to get more into the engineering of it. And it also gives you basic um, guidance as to, depending on your soil type, uh, what sort of clearance you should be giving these structures and what sort of hydraulic conductivity you can expect. Um, what we have done uh, in the tool is we've taken the uh, water sensitive urban design basic project procedures for source control, which was John Argue's uh, manual. And uh, we've kind of integrated a lot of the mathematics into the infiltration engine uh, in Insight Water. So it just kind of does that 
uh, quietly in the background. So uh, I guess for us to pass our first thing here, what we're trying to do is just put more water into the ground. So um, the simplest way to do that is to maybe take the driveway and put in a treatment type. We could do infiltration um, and uh, just use trial and error in the tool to um, see how that might work for an infiltration pit, for example. Uh, and there would, we would pass our volume result. Um, or we can just choose different ways of doing that. So the simplest one that we kind of recommend for just about any developments uh, is permeable paving. Um, but it's permeable paving with some sort of storage uh, in there. So you can't put permeable pavers straight onto compacted uh, building soil or compacted clay. You, you need some sort of um, uh, proper base um, to put your permeable paving on. But permeable paving will also get more water into the ground and allow you to pass uh, this. Um, you can also, uh, I guess, harvest more water or less water by changing your, your stormwater tank sizes as well and that will uh, change your uh, your volume score and the target is no more than a 10 percent increase in average annual volume compared to pre-development levels all right so once we're happy with that uh, we can move on to our next criteria here's an example of an infiltration trench from Mitcham um, they've just dug a trench uh, lined the sides with um, uh, a geofabric, backfilled it, and uh, put your put your grass back on top. All right. Uh, impervious area assumptions are for the previous development case. So that's a great question. Thanks, Belinda. Um, so the assumption is uh, for a pre-development imperviousness of. Uh, 0.4, uh, that's your base case. Now that is adjustable uh, depending on your local policy and, uh, and I guess your, your local practices and also defend, depending I guess on really what your local drainage system is designed for. So if you're in a, a kind of commercial area, you might have a, a, a drainage system that's designed for a higher capacity, but um, what you can do is adjust that maybe to quarter acre blocks. So if you don't know what your drainage system design is designed for, um, you can probably make a, a, a nice conservative assumption that your base case uh, impervious fraction is 0.35 um, for residential areas. Um, and that is, that is adjustable here. Um, if it was commercial, you'd, you'd probably assume that this is a, uh, a more robust drainage system, but it really is about the pipes that surround the development rather than, I guess, what was on site before the project commenced. It's really about what, what your drainage system can handle. So that's our volume. So I want to move on to flow. Uh, and this is where things get, I guess, uh, really interesting for civil engineers and for councils uh, because I guess no two councils have exactly the same drainage since uh, drainage system. They'll have different guidelines and and local practices. Um, so what we've done is built in an OSD calculation engine, uh, but also made it flexible enough to be able to cater for, I guess, uh, different local policies. Um, we were thinking of putting um, a one size fits all uh, OSD policy into the uh, the planning scheme, but that that didn't quite get up. So uh, it still have, uh, it still is up to local councils to set exactly what your specifications are. Um, now, uh, a bit of a warning here. I'm going to get a uh, uh, very engineering. So if I start um, speaking another language, uh, it's okay. Just uh, daydream off or ask questions or um, uh, whatever. But trust me, for civil engineers, this is going to be fascinating. Uh, and for me, I, I find this stuff exciting as an engineer. So um, 
what's going on here? So once we get we get back to our, our hydrograph, uh, and you've got pre-development hydrograph uh, where um, flows over time are manageable, and a lot of the water just infiltrates into the ground or gets caught up uh, in the biomass and and trans evaporated in a rural or forested catchment. Once we go and develop and pave everything and put roofs and, and paving, a hydrograph gets much more picky. We get a lot more volume. The volume is the area under this curve and also the flow rates get a lot higher and also flow runs off a lot sooner, uh, which is relevant for streams and downstream flooding. So what are our approaches to deal with this? So there's a few different approaches. The one is we can add detention uh, we call on-site detention, OSD. And what you do is you cap the flow rate coming out of the site, but you don't change the volume. So it becomes this red line. Um, so uh, if you have a, a developed site with OSD, you have uh, the same volume. So that's the area under the curve, but at a slower flow rate. So that's one approach. Um, another approach, which is the default in InSight is to actually capture uh, volume and keep it on site and only release it slowly. So this is uh, John Argue and the University SA approach. Um, and what is default is what we call um, regime imbalance. So what you do is you capture the difference uh, in a one in five year storm between the pre-development volume and the post-development vo volume. So this will be this dark blue area. So your final hydrograph ends up looking like this blue line where you've just taken the peak off it. Uh, and also reduce the volume under the line. We've also got another option um, in the tool, which I'll show you now. Uh, if we go to our local catchment settings, um, by default, it's set to volume retention and infiltration, but we can also set it to something called yield minimum. So what we're trying to do with yield minimum is to capture the entire volume of a one in five year storm. And that means your site hydrograph ends up being more like this purple dotted line. So we're reducing flow rates and volume just by trying to capture those large storm events in their entirety. And you'd use this setting when your local drainage system is entirely already overloaded and stuffed, and you need to start repairing that drainage system by taking some of the pressure off that system. So if you've got a known, a known problem area that's always flooding, you can't upgrade the pipes. Uh, that's when you, uh, as a local authority, might actually specify this yield minimum approach. Um, uh, but by default, we don't do that. So there's a good question about AEP. I'll, I'll come back uh, to that in a moment. Um, because so many councils do have OSD policies and like on-site detentions, you can use this tool in on-site detention mode. So uh, once again, that's using this red line hydro, trying to create this red line hydrograph where you're you're um, limiting the peak flow. So we call this peak flow uh, in meters per second or liters per second, we call that PSD, permissible site discharge. All right, so that's, uh, I guess, a basic explanation of the different options in the tool. And as I said, by default, we use volume retention because that's what the AR and R and the planning scheme uh, wants, but you can use it for OSD instead. If we've got it in OSD mode, uh, what we're using is uh, essentially Boyd's hydrograph. We're working out the volume of storage required to turn this uh, post-development peak flow rate to this pre-development peak flow rate using uh, uh, simplified mathematics of a triangular hydrograph. So we're turning this curve into this dotted curve by storing this amount of water and releasing it. All right. So... Uh, there's a few sort of options built in to that. Firstly, you can change the pre-development uh, imperviousness based on your local drainage design. Secondly, you can uh, you can uh, do the pre-development design storm and the post-development detention requirement. So um, most councils have uh, different policies and practices around this. Uh, some councils uh, have very high uh, pre-development storms or very low, but um, we've put in a default residential and a default industrial. So um, what's in the code is actually a, an 18 point something percent AEP, which is a, essentially a one in five year storm. So let's 
let's go with that. Um, and what, what you'll notice is that this changes, I guess, the, um, the allowable site discharge. Um, with gutters, gutters are normally designed for about a one in 20 year storm, um, which is a uh, about a 5% AEP pits and gutters. Anything beyond a 5% a, a AEP, um, you're kind of wasting your time for pit and pipe design because uh, the water will be flowing down the road. You, you do have to uh, factor in the big storms, but it's it's what's called your major drainage system. It's when water is sheeting over the surface rather than going down down drains. Um, now, if this ARI versus AEP uh, stuff is confusing as well, um, we we do provide some uh, guidance as well, I guess on. Um, on the difference. So what, what we have is a, a user manual. You can open up the user manual uh, and this will provide you with uh, all the details that uh, you wanted, but were, I guess, too afraid to ask. So in the user manual, if we, um, it's got everything that I'm talking through today and at the end of it, we have things like um, how to translate AEP into ARI and an explanation of, of I guess, what that means, uh, which can confuse even the civil engineers. Um, all right, so back to the tool, um, back to our project. Um, you can set also the detention requirements. So some councils actually in difficult sites will set a hundred year uh, detention requirement and that will greatly increase, I guess, our OSD volume. So this is our calculated OSD volume in meters cubed. Uh, and you can set, I guess, the, the, um, the size of the OSD. Um, now, one thing uh, I'll talk about is time of concentration in a second. Now, if you find there's no settings that fit your policies, what you can do is just override the permissible site discharge. And instead of using the default calculated discharge, you could say, do a, a bigger uh, PSD. Um, and this will give you a smaller uh, required uh, OSD tank size. And uh, I just know there's a lot of argy bargy between um, consultants and councils as to uh, PSD and, and this sort of stuff. But um, we have built that flexibility into the tool. Um, so council can say, if you knew the amount of uh, capacity of your pipes and you divided that by the area of the site, you could act, you can actually just manually give this uh, liters per second and that will work out the OSD tank size based on uh, the local requirements. All right. So um, just to dive really deeply into the civil engineering, um, Insight by default uses a time of concentration of 30 minutes and a TSO of 10 minutes. So um, we have locked that into the tool. Um, if, uh, if you really wanted, uh, wanted to, we could, we could unlock it, but it's, it's simpler if we just lock it up, it will get rid of 90% of the arguments. Um, so why have we done this and what does it mean? So a time of concentration is the time that it takes water to flow down a catchment. Um, and assuming uh, that water's flowing about two meters per second in a pipe, a time of concentration of 30 minutes is about 3.2 kilometers. So why we've set it at, at a sort of a three kilometer radius um, or a three kilometer catchment is that the new Engineers Australia guide uh, basically discourages on-site detention. Uh, except in one circumstance, which is when you're trying to protect local pipes and essentially get more stormwater uh, through small pipes. But what it, the ARNR guide says detention doesn't do is large scale flood prevention. Um, you could do large scale flood prevention, but you'd be setting your catchment size to maybe six hours or 12 hours. Um, what that does in the calculations um, would be mean this was a very small PSD if you're working with a very big 
catchment and that tends to create sort of almost unfeasibly large OSD tanks. So you don't want to be working, I guess, at that whole city's wide scale with OSD. You're really just trying to um, increase the life of your assets. So what Insight Water will assume is about a three kilometer catchment size, which is about right for local councils. Um, every council has slightly different policies, I guess, on, on the settings. Um, and we, we mapped that out, but it was fixed to, when we did this work, um, here the blue line would be your OSD size. That was fixed with a 30 minute time of concentration. In fact, um, it's sort of uh, been standard practice in the industry to drop the time of concentration and therefore get a bigger PSD and a much smaller OSD tank. Um, but we recommend 30 minutes is just a good balance um, of tank size. Now, in the case of a one in a hundred year storm, say you wanted to design your systems to a one in a hundred year, um, you could do that with the calculator. Um, as I said, I wouldn't really recommend it though, because in a one in a hundred year storm event, um, you're kind of talking about the Lismore kind of, kind of events where your water tanks won't help, they'll actually be floating down the road. Um, so for your 1% AEP, type engineering, you're really looking at the major drainage system, which essentially ignores all your pits and pipes and gutters and just assumes a flooded flooded overland flow. So in order to address that, you really need to be looking at your relative levels and making sure that um, your developments are, um, I guess, above the, uh, the height where flooding will affect them and uh, also doing some of your basic uh, design things just like making sure that when you do have your uh, your development all right here's our site plan um, just basic stuff so that say this is on a hill all this driveway isn't funneling straight into someone's back door um, or if it is if it's funneling hopefully it's funneling towards the road if it's funneling all that way you want to have some some big um uh, some sort of culverts or some sort of protection to to prevent nuisance flooding, but it's things get really hard in a one hundred year event. Event it's generally considered an insurable event rather than something you can manage. That's pretty much it for our stormwater. Now, how we actually pass this in the tool is we can add additional site storage. So, say um, we'd settled on, you know, maybe an overrided PSD. We've decided that we need five thousand liters of additional storage. We can put that 5,000 liters in here. Uh, that will immediately show you, show the applicant, I guess, what we mean by OSD, generally an extended uh, underground pipe with inspection pits and trash screens and that sort of thing. Um, and it'll show that uh, this is passed. Um, alternatively, if you didn't want to do uh, OSD, you could do things like increase the amount of pervious paving. Um, which would decrease, uh, I guess, the relative perviousness of uh, the, the, relative, the relative imperviousness of the site. Uh, and therefore, that would also reduce our detention requirements and also perhaps help us pass without an underground OSD system. Uh, underground OSD systems can be difficult um, and expensive, particularly if they're clashing with tree root zones or other underground infrastructure, or if there's nowhere convenient to put underground OSD. As I said, by default, we do have volume retention uh, regime imbalance, which is where um, the site will try and store the, uh, the volume of a one in five year storm uh, and the difference between pre and post development volumes. And we find overall for the larger catchment that actually gets um, usually better outcomes for the entire drainage system uh, than OSD uh, because um, you're reducing both the flow rate and the overall volume trying to get through uh, the drainage system. The other thing I should mention about the tool is that if you don't want to do underground OSD, well, you can do underground OSD. And if you're doing it in retention mode, it'll actually show you uh, a retention and infiltration pit rather than 
uh, a, an OSD detention pit. Um, but you can also add retention volume uh, in your water tanks. So if you're doing it above ground, you would use this section here, uh, which is re reserved kind of detention space. So you might, um, you might be adding say 500 liters into eight tanks. That would give you a couple of thousand liters uh, of, uh, of volume storage. And that would also allow you to pass this flow section. All right, and that is that. So, you know, what, what I'm hoping for this tool is uh, proper integrated water management where uh, the engineers of council get what they need both to look after their drainage system, either uh, from an OSD or a volume retention point of view, but also these other, other uh, aspects of water quality and uh, integrated water management. So let's look into some of the other aspects. First of all, I guess Insight Water does provide more detail for people who are thinking of doing underground detention. It provides these simplified diagrams or within the tool that provides um, more engineering kind of uh, single line diagrams. Um, but if people are asking you, say, if you are working in a council or if you are uh, an engineer and you want to find out more, you can once again go, once again, go to the water treatment systems uh, section, uh, maybe ask about on-site detention, and it will give you uh, these simplified diagrams and also refer you to AS3500, which is, um, I guess, the final word on OSD tank design, um, because uh, OSD tanks are probably the only bit of integrated water management treatment that actually is in the plumbing code. And um, also, we have guidance for permeable paving uh, which is, I guess, simplified engineering guidance. Uh, and it just says things for permeable paving, like, you know, don't put your pavers straight onto clay, have some sort of volume and infiltration uh, system. And also some rules of, rules of thumb, like um, the depth of the storage should be approximately uh, three times um, the rainfall depth that you're trying to capture things like that. So there's more, uh, I won't go to all the details, but with pervious paving, just try and make sure that the, de the designs have some chance for stormwater to be captured and therefore to slowly infiltrate. Um, the drainage, slotted drainage pipe is optional and it's more if there's a, uh, a situation where there's a chance of water logging or impervious clays below the site, um, or perhaps some, you're dealing with some sort of slope where you, we, you do need to um, uh, have some sort of built-in overlays. Um, here's some, I guess, some more pictures of, of what uh, pervious paving might look like. It might be pavers with uh, void spaces, or it might be a, a more advanced kind of um, uh, system. Uh, the pervious paving is more expensive than straight concrete or uh, bitumen, but it does tend to be cheaper than um, an OSD tank a separate OSD tank. So um, these things, uh, there are some costs, but it's kind of manageable. The cheapest system of all the three is probably the above ground detention tank where um, you have a water tank already, but you just make it a bit bigger and you put this slow drainage system there. Um, the incremental size between say a, a 1000 liter tank and a 2000 liter tank is, is only a couple of hundred dollars. It's not, uh, not massive. So I'll, I'll quickly move on to quality. So um, overall with quality, we're, we're trying to protect the waterways and, uh, and the ocean from um, dispersed uh, non-point source pollutants like nitrogen and suspended solids. So the best way to do that with, is with biological treatment. Essentially it's the microorganisms and the slime in the gravel that, uh, that will treat your stormwater and eat, uh, uh, eat the nitrogen, uh, capture the the fine solids and the phosphorus. Um, so we use things like rain gardens, we use swales, we use infiltration. Um, also water tanks will actually capture um, dispersed pollutants and divert them through the sewerage system or, or through irrigation. So water tanks also work to treat uh, pollutants. Um, so to use these in the Insight Water tool, once again, if we go back to our, our site and say we weren't passing the water quality 
um, say we were using less, less pervious paving um, and still not quite passing, what you can do is click on the Y and it'll take you to a page of uh, guidelines and also tips and tricks. Um, but in your project, probably the easiest thing is to uh, add some more treatments. And in this case, we might take the downpipes that are not connected to the tank, 90 square meters, and perhaps add a rain garden uh, or some sort of treatment. So when you select the treatment, uh, immediately the user of the tool will be given these sort of diagrams so that they actually, I guess, understand what they're signing up for. Um, and you can just, um, uh, with trial and error, just work out your, your treatment sizes to pass the criteria. So in this case, we've done it with a rain garden. Um, because rain gardens do come with a bit of a maintenance liability, we tend to in, uh, encourage them more for uh, your commercial and industrial areas that are going to have some sort of landscaping. Um, townhouses, they can be a bit problematic. Townhouses... Uh, designs are very tight. So we tend to do more the pervious paving and water tank solutions rather than having uh, rain gardens, but you could do it with a rain garden or a swale uh, or some infiltration um, uh, systems would, would also get the same sort of water quality outcomes that we're trying to do, or bigger water tanks would also work. All right, so that's that's our options for passing quality. And finally, we've got water efficiency. So water efficiency uh, is mostly done through just having enough water tanks um, and enough roof connected to the water tanks to make them effective. Um, but there's also some options in here for people just to commit to more water efficient fittings. Uh, so in this case, we might have uh, uh, more efficient or even perhaps less efficient toilets if we wanted to use more stormwater. Um, and this also lets us uh, do a couple of things. So if you're say an industrial and the bath is not applicable, you can set that to not applicable or if there are no baths and that will adjust your water efficiency. Um, we can also put a, a recycled water source as well. So um, in some cases uh, the recycled water will be used. Uh, in this case, the model will preference water tanks um, and use the stormwater first before the recycled water, if there's both, um, uh, but it'll let you hit your, your water efficiency targets without a water tank if you've got recycled water or super efficient fittings. Um, so there's also some extra settings in here for the rainwater tank. So you can choose what it's connected to um, by default, it's connected to laundry. The water tank balance for residential tends to work a lot better if your cold water tap, so your, your um, washing machine and your laundry cold tap are connected to the water tank. You want to be using more water. Um, what you don't want to be doing is, uh, I guess, getting uh, this pattern here. Say you just had a small amount of irrigation connected to the water tank. You don't want this vampire tooth pattern showing up. What this means is the, the rainwater tank overflow is very high. Um, and essentially it's not having, if all the water is just going straight into a tank and then straight out again, um, your water tank's not going to be doing much for your flooding or um, other stormwater issues. So you don't want to have a water tank that's just overburdened and not using that stormwater, you really want it, that tank to be emptying regularly. Uh, hot water will really use a lot of water, but um, it's complicated in the plant plumbing scheme. So um, it, by default, it's off. But what this engine actually does is it takes 20 years of daily rainfall da data and runs a continuous simulation based on actual roof size and actual building occupancy and actual end uses and things like irrigated garden area, it's got a proper irrigation calculator, um, agricultural quality irrigation calculator in there. Um, and also more flexibility, say you had an apartment building that was more than uh, four stories, you might only connect the first fleet three floors eh? because there's just not enough water to uh, 
uh, satisfy more than that. So you might um, drop the actual number of toilets connected down a bit as a percentage. So that covers off uh, water quality and efficiency. Um, but the key things, I guess, the, the key design outcomes that I look for uh, using this when I'm assessing this is um, plenty of water storage, uh, just to take a lot of the volume out of the stormwater system and to provide good amenity and, and economics for water saving. I'm gonna be looking for either some sort of infiltration or pervious paving um, or rain garden, um, of which pervious paving is my preferred option for townhouses in particular, um, just because it's, uh, I guess, less long-term maintenance liability. Uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna be wanting to see uh, a nice pass in all this. Then I might also drill down into what sort of um, uh, flood prevention strategy is being used, uh, whether it's volume management or OSD, and just look at the, uh, the details about how that's been worked out. So once we've, we're happy with the, I suppose, the, um, the stormwater design, um, we hit save and we can go to our report uh, functionality. Um, and it'll, it'll print a report saying, I guess, how we've achieved the multiple criteria here that are in the planning scheme and uh, in the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Guide. So uh, we go to our, our print certificate page. Uh, we choose the project that we want to print and we hit show report. And what this does is it generates a non-editable PDF report uh, that is designed to be um, accessible by councils, accessible by responsible authorities and by planners to have either passed or not passed the requirements of the planning scheme. And we do that just by showing the scores up front and stating whether things pass and putting it in big bold green that it meets the policy objectives or it'll be big bold and red if it doesn't. Um, there are some situations where you can approve, um, I guess, a report that doesn't meet all the criteria. So say, for example, you're on a very steep site or uh, a site where uh, hydrologically things are just very difficult. You're, you're on bedrock or there's salinity or, or whatever. Um, you might want to take the context into account and just uh, allow some um, leniency in terms of meeting this, depending on what, uh, you know, whether it is a good idea to um, be infiltrating or not, um, that sort of thing. Um, so once you've got this report, use these little buttons up here to either open or download or print. What I'll do actually is I'll hit the download one um, and we'll look at this report in detail. So um, if you're using Insight Water in your councils, um, you'll probably receive um, reports that look like this. And uh, the first time you see it, it can be a bit uncomfortable, but after you've seen a few, um, it's, uh, I find quite a convenient way to uh, assess council. So what it says is what people have selected. So in this case, um, the design has put a thousand liters connected to 360 meters squared of roof uh, and additional detention of 2000 liters. So what I'd then be wanting to do is go back and look at the site plans and just make sure that, you know, there were uh, eight water tanks or 10 water tanks that added up to this and that there was some note on the plans uh, that are going through the planning system that this is what's happening. Um, you'd show that, you know, there's there's a uh, roof not connected to the tank that might go into a pervious area or pervious paving um, or, or no treatment. Um, so in this case, there's paths that have no treatment and the driveway which is draining to 100 meters squared of pervious paving in this case. Uh, rainwater tanks, and th this is our rainwater tank section, so it provides more detail on the rainwater tanks, how big the retention is, what it's connected to, how big the, the detention is, um, and what it's connected to, and the reliability. Uh, we've got our water efficiency specifications. Uh, we've got 
uh, how people worked out the occupancy, which you can just kind of check off as well. And then there are the stormwater quality calculations. Um, I won't go into this too much more, but um, the main one is nitrogen reduction, which is shown here. There's also a page of your site storage calculations. So this is where you can say, do the pre-development, look at the pre-development, impervious fraction used, uh, base case runoff coefficient, um, what the pre-development detention was, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, it'll show you, if you're using OSD, it'll show you also your basic um, Boyd's equations of depth and um, storage volume for the different uh, durations of storms. Uh, if you have no idea what that means, don't worry. Uh, for civil engineers, this is, um, this is something uh, that happens. We do a fair bit to size an appropriate uh, sized um, water storage. Um, if it's on volume retention mode, this will just be blank. So finally in the report, it's got these more detailed um, diagrams because um, I think at councils, we get very sick of reports that just have a box saying, you know, a blank square that says this is a water tank, another blank square that says this is this is a rain garden or this is permeable paving. So it, it actually provides a useful report that then, then go on to the designers and the builder um, that actually goes some way to specifying what uh, is meant by these designs. Inside water, uh, it doesn't stop at residential. Um, you can, in fact, a really good use is for small commercial and small to medium industrial. Um, you don't use it necessarily for the mega projects that are just acres and acres of roof, but um, there's a lot of uh, small to medium commercial and industrial development where you still want to be getting good integrated water management outcomes. So here's an example of an industrial site. And what we would do is we'd put these areas into insight water, uh, like we just did uh, uh, into the site. And then we would add our water sensitive urban design features. So some of the things you you want to note for industrial is probably water tanks are kind of useless for big sheds. Um, in fact, if you try and connect a giant roof to a tiny water tank that only uses one or two toilets as their demand, um, what we actually see is water tanks popping um, because there's just too much water trying to go through. So unless there's a, a process use, i.e. a manufacturing use for that stormwater, you, you probably wouldn't even bother um, putting a water tank on industrial, maybe just a tiny corner of it. Uh, water tanks do work really well though for office buildings. So most industrial have some office areas. Um, so those office areas are full of lots of people and lots of people use lots of water. So um, the, the water balance works quite well for offices where you, you put a maybe a, a five, 10, 20,000 litre tank on an office area and uh, you get a good water balance of, of people using that water for, for flushing toilets or uh, or whatever else. Um, for industrial areas, you probably would be using uh, mainly something like a swale. Uh, there's industrial sites, there's usually land available, hopefully near the legal point of discharge uh, where you can put in a nice big swale. In this case, we've put um, uh, 25 square meters of swale um, to treat, uh, treat the roof area. Uh, and that, um, that can be sort of maintained as part of the garden, garden sort of maintenance. Uh, you can also put in impervious parking areas. Uh, you probably wouldn't use impervious surfaces for the truck parking and truck turning areas. It's just too heavy duty and those big trucks, unless you've got really specifically engineered pervious paving, um, they're just gonna tear up anything um, that hasn't been done uh, done exceptionally well. So you'd probably just have impervious driveways for your truck parking. Um, but for treated driveways, you might have a couple of other um, uh, swales or uh, rain gardens or, or just uh, um, your grass buffers to, to treat the other impervious areas. Now, also one final thing I'll flag is um, there are situations with industrials and things like um, refueling areas and um, uh, particularly service stations, which come under environmental management laws rather than stormwater laws. So if you want to know more about chemical and fuel storage, um, 
go to the EPA in South Australia because um, there are specific things that you have to do. Um, so the last thing you want is chemical storage area that is on an impervious area or that goes to a rain garden. We kind of do the opposite. So what we do for chemical storage areas, we actually put a roof over it. Think a very big carport and the roof for that big awning or carport should go to the stormwater system. But on the ground level, you've probably got funding um, or some sort of a spill catchment that will go to a specific uh, stormwater treatment device, something that will treat oils or actually just an underground tank that will capture and store um, any spills or uh, problems that happen in your bunded area. So bunding means you, you put a bit of a wall around it. So any spills will actually be contained in that chemical storage area. So for more information about uh, that, go see the EPA or get an environmental uh, management plan done for the site. But just please don't confuse stormwater with um, a high risk uh, chemical or fuel storage and refueling areas. Uh, truck washdown also comes into that, that category of uh, high impact. All right, and that pretty much covers off what I need to say about commercial and industrial. Um,